that but that pressure that panic and that that procrastination in waiting till the end of the day that all works that it all works for me i just i get so um i get so focused have you ever heard the phrase becoming the best version of yourself yeah me too but what does that even mean and how do we become that person I'm here to help you navigate through those questions and come up with actionable steps in order for you to live your best life. We've got to discover what we want. We've got to figure out a plan on how to get there, and then we have to go. We can't just sit and wait any longer. Life won't wait on us. So come join me on this constant journey to become the best version of yourself and to find your best you. I'll see you on the other side. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Nick Carrier's Best You Podcast. Really excited for today's interview. It's going to be, I know it's going to be a really unique episode because, well, frankly, there's uh, not too many editorial cartoonists out there. So I know we're going to get a unique perspective on uh, on you, Mike. We have Mike Luckovich with me here today. I appreciate you spending the time with me today, Mike. Sure. Uh, Nick, thank you for uh, pronouncing my name correctly. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. So Mike is an editorial cartoonist who has worked for the AJC now, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, back since 1989. And you've won two Pulitzer Prizes now as well back in 1995 and 2006, which is awesome and super cool. And I know we're going to get into a lot of things, your career, early on in your career, about how how you go about creating a cartoon and that thought process. So I'm really excited to get all into all that today. But basically the way I want to start is kind of going back um, – to when you graduated from University of Washington um, back in 1982, I learned that you did sold life insurance for a little bit, and then you also did some freelance selling your cartoons and stuff like that. So I kind of want want to take you back and take the listeners back to that time and kind of what is going through your head. Were you knowing that you want to 100 percent do cartoons and like what were your goals kind of at that point in time? Yeah, well, when I was a junior in college, uh, I, I told my girlfriend, now my wife. That I thought I'd, I'd uh, you know, get into social work because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Even though the whole time in high school and even in college at the and at the University of Washington, I was drawing editorial cartoons. And so, at some point, either my junior or senior year, I just thought, you know, I'm going to try and become an editorial cartoonist because uh, that's what I love to do. Uh, so I graduated from college. I sent out 300 resumes to newspapers all around the all around the country. And no one wanted to hire me. Uh, being an editorial cartoonist, uh, there there are now very few editorial cartoonists left. And even when I was starting out, there weren't that many. Uh, I think I would have had a better chance to, to become like a major league baseball player than an editorial cartoonist, just just because of the numbers. <laughs> uh, so I sent these 300 out, and I didn't I didn't get a good response. But I had to make a living because my then girlfriend and I were going to be getting married. So. Uh, I started selling life insurance. Uh, this was a, a, a friend's dad had this agency, and it was selling uh, life insurance to union members. And so we would travel. We were, we were in Seattle, and we would travel to eastern Washington to these little little towns like Pasco and Kennewick, these little little small towns, and we would try and sell people life insurance. And it was all, you know, it was sort of a scam in a way. I mean, it was and I just, I hated it. I, it was like the worst thing in the world. And I, I actually uh, drove around. I had a, a Ford Pinto. I don't know if you've heard of, heard of a Pinto before, but they were like these l- really crappy cars. So I drove around with a Ford Pinto, uh, drove around in a Ford Pinto on my uh, appointments to, to see union members. And I kept this uh, a magazine on the passenger side uh, of my car. And it was a, it was a, uh, it was a magazine about uh, the newspaper industry. And it had, had, uh, classified ads in it for jobs and so uh, one I got one and had a, a job offered in in the eastern United States I didn't know where so I kept that on, out on my car my car seat and, I, and eventually uh, I, I applied for that job and I got it in uh, Greenville South Carolina that was my first my first job as a car, as a cartoonist wow and you saw you said you saw that in a magazine yeah yeah I mean it was just you know, the, uh, again, they don't have. There weren't many editorial cartooning jobs available. So when this one came out, I was just thinking, "Oh man, this is my this is my chance to get away from uh, selling life insurance." So uh, 
uh, I got that job and, and we, we took a U-Haul and we drove five days from Seattle to, to Greenville, South Carolina. Yeah. Well, so when you applied to be an editorial cartoonist and for that, for the newspaper in South Carolina, did you send them a bunch of your work and stuff or how does that application process look like? Right. Yeah. You know, I was, I was selling life insurance, but uh, on the side, on the weekends, I was freelancing editorial cartoons to newspapers in the Seattle area. So, uh, so I had a kind of a portfolio uh, of recent cartoons. So I, I sent those to, to a uh, Greenville and then each week, uh, I would send them more and more so they, they could kind of have a, an idea of what, what kind of stuff I was doing. Mm -hmm. So you did this for about two years before you moved to South Carolina, right? Well, I sold life insurance for two years and right. until I got my job in Greenville and then, and then I started my, uh, cartooning career. Yeah. So looking back on it, I'm sure that two years doesn't seem like a whole lot of time, but I feel like when you're in the moment, two years feels like forever. So did you feel like when you were doing it, did you always have hope that you were at some point going to get a job as a cartoonist? Or did you think at some point that you might have to like change your career focus to something else? You know what? I, I really, that was my only focus was to become an editorial cartoonist. And, uh, and at the time when I was selling life insurance, I would, you know, I'd go to like uh, grocery stores. And I would look at magazines and I would see ed other editorial cartoonists uh, that were very young around my age. I think, oh, crap, they got a job and I don't have one. So, but I just kept hoping. I didn't know if I'd get one or not. But I just thought, you know what? I'm just going to keep trying and trying. And, and event, you know, after two years, it, two years isn't that long a time. But it, during that during that time, I, I mean, I frigging hated uh, selling life insurance. So it, it was really, it, it seemed like a, a, a long period, but I was so happy to, to have finally gotten hired somewhere. Right. So, you know, you, know, you said you always knew you kind of wanted to be an editorial cartoonist and, and through doing the research, I realized that, you know, you said you just always loved drawing and stuff at a young age. You started drawing cartoons and stuff at like six and always loved doing it growing up. But at what point did it kind of shift to being like, I know this is something that I could actually do and might want to do for a living? Yeah. Well, you know, before I got my job as an, as a, uh, uh, and while I was still in school, before I started as a life insurance salesman, I was drawing for my school newspapers and I was reading, I don't know if you uh, are familiar with Mad Magazine. Uh, it was, uh, you know, when I was young, it was, I think it came out every couple of weeks or something. And it was just, it just had beautiful artwork. It was really a fun uh, uh, cartoon magazine to read. And so I started looking at Mad Magazine, and I thought, oh, that would be great to draw for Mad Magazine. And so it started, I mean, I was in high school when I started thinking I should, I should be a cartoonist. But it never, it never really, it wasn't until late in, in college that I thought, well, I have an actual chance to do this, or I have an actual, I'm going to actually try to do this. Because it, earlier it always just had seemed sort of like a dream, like that it's not going to be possible. But when I realized I sucked at everything else, I realized I needed, <laughs> I needed to get a job doing what I, what I was good at. So that's why that's when I really started to focus on that. Okay, gotcha. And so you started that back with that in 1984. You were in South Carolina a little bit, and then you went to New Orleans pretty soon right. Pretty soon thereafter. Um, and so there's kind of like this five, five and a half year gap between that and before and the AJC. So tell me a little bit about that time in New Orleans, about like the different things that you learned and what allowed you to be able to kind of take that next step to moving to Atlanta and working for the AJC. Yeah, well, so I was in, yeah, so I was in uh, Greenville for the paper there for like 11, 11 months. Right. And then New Orleans hired me. And, uh, and so, and, and I, I, I enjoyed New Orleans, but uh, so, so I was in New Orleans and there was a, there was a political convention. I can't, you know, it was like in the eighties or something a long time ago. And, and the political convention was in Atlanta. And so I, I went there uh, working for the uh, Times Picayune in New Orleans, and I was there for the convention. And I just remember thinking, "Geez, Atlanta is a pretty cool city." And uh, and uh, so that's when I started thinking about Atlanta. And then when they when when that job opened up, they uh, they they wanted to hire me, and I, and for some reason I can't remember, but I I turned it down initially, and then they came back to me a couple weeks later and said, Hey, well, you know, would you give it another shot? And, and since I already kind of liked Atlanta, uh, I, I eventually took the job. So I've, I've been here for, for a long time. Okay. 
Gotcha. So when you were uh, when you were in New Orleans or even maybe early on in your time in Atlanta, I understand that as an edit- editorial cartoonist, your your day is very much probably spent kind of alone or like doing your own thing, kind of coming up with your own ideas. But did you have any you have any like major role models or any mentors that you looked up to or that taught you big lessons in terms of like your career and becoming like a better editorial cartoonist? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there was a there's a cartoonist. uh who was at Mad Magazine, and uh, his name is Mort Mort Drucker. Uh, you can look him up, I'm sure, online on, on on Google. But he he was this beautiful artist, and I used to think, oh man, that is just. He used to do movie satires for Mad Magazine, and uh, so he would do like The Godfather, and he would do these beautiful drawings. And he he was a he he was he he's an ex- excellent caricaturist, and and so I really loved his stuff. And then uh, there there was a uh, an and then I started noticing an editorial cartoonist named Jeff McNelly, who who uh, drew for the Richmond Time Dispatch in, in Virginia, and he he was a he he was a beautiful artist. So those were the two uh, people that I really that really inspired me. Uh, and now, uh, so I got to, you know, as I be, after I became an editorial cartoonist, I got to be friends with Jeff McNelly and and Mort Drucker, who's who's, you know, I think he's in his late 80s now, but I see him at. Uh, uh, cartooning conventions and we're friends so that's kind of fun gotcha so when you were looking at these these two guys cartoons like obviously you liked at an early age you liked to draw but i feel like there's a big there's a big difference between enjoying to draw and enjoying to draw cartoons and then wanting to become an editorial cartoonist there's a gap there so when you saw like these couple people's cartoons what was it about it like what was similar between those two that made you attracted to them and make you made you look up to what the work that they put out yeah. Well, uh, again, they were just, they both had this beautiful, they were both beautiful artists. And, and, uh, so when I was in high school, I was looking at their, their cartoons and, and instead of going to like the football games on Friday nights, I would stay in my room and look at their artwork and try to be as good an good an artist as they were. And I would look at how they would do, how they would do, uh, caricatures. They, there used to be these magazines uh, these like movie star magazines, uh, sort of like maybe like National Enquirer now, but they had they would have photos of movie stars like Paul Newman in them, and so I would I would get a photo of of someone like Paul Newman, and I would try to draw a, a caricature the way that these guys drew, trying to do a cartoon image, uh, and, and try and get a likeness, and so that's really I so I really kind of learned on my own by looking at, at other other people's work. And then when I was in college, I went to the University of Washington, and and so to pay for school, uh, I would I there's there's this it's called the Seattle Center, which is in uh, which is where the Space Needle is in Seattle, and so I got a job there uh, drawing caricatures of people. So for four years, that's how I paid my way through college. Was was uh, during the summers, I just set up a booth, and people would line up, and I would and I would draw them, and so that was really a good training training ground for me wow that's so cool that's so cool that you did that um did you did you always did you always have an interest in like when did the interest in in politics start to come geez you know it it wasn't i think until i got into college i I mean i remember uh in high school not really knowing the difference between democrats and republicans uh in high school i drew for i i my my father uh, transferred around to various places in the West, to uh, from Seattle to uh, Boise, Idaho, and to Eugene, Oregon. So when I so I would join the school newspapers of those schools, and I, I went to a, a Catholic school in Boise, Catholic high school, and I wasn't really political, so I just sort of concentrated on uh, drawing the, uh, you know, sort of the uh, eccentric nuns and priests that worked at the school. And that's that was just early on, and then I then then in college I started to develop develop my political views. Gotcha, I got you. So, did you did that help? Did that help you gain a passion for like the job role that you eventually wanted to do? Like, did that like did I know you want you really loved drawing, but did a passion for politics spark you? Like, this is something that I want to do oh, long term. Yeah, right. Oh no, it did because. You know, I thought at first that I, I, I might be fun to draw for Mad Magazine, but once I got into politics and I realized that, you know, you could, 
you know, in a, in a single image, you could make a point that, you know, that you could share with people and try and, and try and educate them through your, through your drawings. That became like such a, uh, a passion for me and a, and, and a, and a vocation to, to do that. So for me, editorial cartoon isn't just a fun job, which it is. I, I love it every day, but it really, I really feel like such a, uh, an importance in trying to explain what what I believe is going on in the world and in politics and in, 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 in our government because so much of our government is is spin and it's and it's uh, uh, not you know a lot of it's false and you have to so you have to kind of uh, uh, read and understand and think about it and then and then uh, bring to its essence, an issue in a single panel to make your point. And, and it's a challenge. It's really a challenge every single day to do that. Hmm. So, um, when you're, tell me a little bit about the thought process of, of creating these cartoons. Cause you know, you just talk, talked about how you, in one picture, you can give across kind of your take on what's going on in the world right now. So give me a little bit of the thought process of like how you go on a day to day basis, going and creating something completely new. Yeah. Well, I, I have the sort of the same process every day. I, I, I get in around noon because I'm not a morning person. And uh, so the first thing I do when I get to my office is, is of course, I have lunch. And then after yeah. lunch, I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting in my office and I'm uh, not really doing anything. I'm, I'm in a way, I'm kind of procrastinating. So I'm reading online and I'm reading the AJC uh, and online, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at different uh, subjects that would be good for a cartoon, things that interest me. And then I sort of write them down. Uh, but I'm not really, that's like the easiest part of the day because I'm just sort of uh, basically farting around. And then it gets to be around 3 o'clock, and my deadline is about, uh, I have to have the drawing done by like 6 o'clock. So when it gets to be around 3 o'clock, I start getting a little bit nervous about coming up with an idea and that sort of focuses me and so I start coming up with ideas and normally the ideas that I come up with they stink the first ones and and so as it gets later and later usually around 4 30 or 5 I'll bring some ideas and I'll show them to an editor that I, I that I know will give me the uh will tell me the truth whether they're good or not because by then I've kind of lost my I don't know whether they're good or not because I've been looking at these ideas and it's like looking right. at the word who, W-H-O. Yeah, and you think it's... If you look at that word for long enough, it loses its meaning. So you need to show it to someone. I need to show my ideas to someone to, to get them to tell me what, what, what they like or not. And a lot of times it's, it'll, be, it'll be 5 o'clock and I still don't have an idea. But that, but that pressure, that panic and that, that procrastination in waiting till the end of the day, that all works... It, it all works for me. I just, I get so, um, I get so focused and, and I can, I, I'm, I'm under pressure, but that pressure really helps me to, to create, uh, or to come up with an idea. And, and the later it gets and the more panicked I get, I'll, I'll sometimes come up with my best cartoons right at the very end of the day, just because I, it, 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 it's, it's like I become much more aware. You know, there's a book, um, uh, and it's called, I think it's called The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. And, and it, it talks about being present and in the moment. Well, when I'm under pressure and I'm running out of time, that's when I'm really present. And that's when I can come up with my, my, uh, my ideas. Huh. I think that's, you know, you, you started off kind of joking about it, about how like you procrastinate. But I really think there's like a lesson there because I think that Sometimes procrastination, it like depends on what, it's, what instance I think you're procrastinating in, but I think that it sparks a sense of urgency and sometimes when you're like forced into a sense of urgency, creation can come yeah. or like that's yeah. when you're most creative sometimes. So like I know, I know that – so like I – when I first moved to Nashville, I started with this one job and then and then quit that job pretty quickly early on and so I was I – had, I had another like kind of side job that I was doing to like keep me on my feet but I was like unemployed in a sense. And so yeah. that, that was the time where I found myself being the most creative 
in terms of like what I can do yeah. to go make money, like what jobs I could go get and, and or create for myself and, and that sort of thing. And so I like to talk about it as like the unemployed mind. But the, the idea is you have this kind of sense of urgency forced upon you in a sense that allows create creative juices to flow that you didn't otherwise have at your disposal. Right. No, that's that's a good point. And, you know, when I sometimes I'll talk to uh, like high school groups and I, I, you know, I talk about how I procrastinate and then at the end of the day, come up with something. And I always feel kind of bad because I don't want, you know, I don't, you know, I don't want kids to, to not do their homework. Right. That's sort of how that's how, but it works for me. It works for me to to delay and delay. And then right when I'm up against this deadline, I come up with something. So um, it's uh, it's a weird way to work, but it, it's worked for me for for many years. Hmm. You know, I had I actually hadn't thought about it in this way until until you just talked about it in terms of I think that if something doesn't re- require creativity, then you shouldn't procrastinate doing it or there's no benefit to procrastinating to it. But if something yeah, if something requires creativity or will benefit from having creativity implemented into it, then there's some benefit to it. Because like a lot of times homework, right? Like math homework, there's no creativity there. It's just doing it. Like a lot of homework and a lot of things in school, there's no creativity and there's no benefit to procrastination. But if it's something like maybe writing a paper or creating a drawing, creating some sort of creative piece, then there's some benefits yeah. to procra- procrastination. Well, that, that's, that's, that's a good point. I'd never thought about that before. Yeah, I, I mean, if you're doing if you're doing math homework or something, and you you have the knowledge, it doesn't require a lot of procrastination because you can just kind of think about it and do it. But yeah, there's something about creativity where, where you know, uh, where you're doing art or you're, you're or you're writing something creative. That 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 pressure sometimes just is like a is such a motivating force, and it just it causes this spark, and and it's 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 really a great thing. Yeah. No. I. I love this topic because as I think when um, when I was younger, you know, a lot of times in school you take personality tests and a lot of those sorts of things, and a lot of times it determines like how creative you are or whatever. And I was I always saw myself as not really on the creative side of things because I was never like that into music, playing an instrument or like drawing or any of that sort of thing. I was just kind of like a sports guy, and so I never thought of myself as creative until like kind of this point in my life a couple of years ago when I was like, I realized that the creativity was kind of forced out of me. And that's kind of what I sometimes have like tried to communicate to a couple of people. Like you are create more creative than you think you are as long as you kind of like force yourself into a sense of urgency. Right, right. Well, and what you're doing right now uh, is creative. I mean, you're thinking about, you know, what people are telling you and you're reflecting on that and you make you make really good points. So that's that's all. That's all part of creativity. That's true. That's true. Um, the the other the other part of your work that I wanted to talk about, you know, is when you said you first start doing these drawings, a lot of them are, are bad right away, right? But I think that a lot of people, if going into a situation, if they knew their first draft was going to be bad, they wouldn't take any action at all. But I think it's really important that you just start. You just kind of get it out there because you know you can start making adjustments because. If you don't start, you don't know where to pivot. You don't know how to adjust. You don't know where to turn. But as long as you do start, you can make those adjustments. So I kind of wanted you to expand a little bit more on the idea of starting even though you don't know what the final project is going to look like exactly. Right. Okay. Well, you know, um, here, here's the thing. I, when, I, when I come up with my ideas, um, I, I show them to people. And a lot of times when you're, when you're an artist, you're uh, – and, and, you know, you, you hesitate to get feedback because you're kind of insecure. But I've always found that when you have when you trust people to tell you that something doesn't work or it's not very good, that's always a great thing. So if, if you are a creative person, if you are an artist and if you, you're creating stuff, it is good to have someone that you can that you can count on to give you uh, feedback. Because when I when when I show my cartoons to an editor and they and I can tell they don't they don't love them. Uh, you know, it, it, it's like another it's like another uh, jolt for me. It, it, it motivates me to, to go back to my office and come up with something better just to to show that I'm not a, a, a failure. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely don't think it does. Um, so do you, when you're drawing, do you, and you know, you, you've said a couple of times about referencing your art as good or bad. Do you, do you think you draw them in the sense of like your own judgment? Do you like, do you want to draw something that you think you would like? Do you want to draw something that you think your editor would like? Do you want to draw something that you think the people who actually see it will like, or is it like a combination of everything? No, you know, I, I kind of, I kind of draw to please myself. And, and, uh, if I think something is, you know, I don't, if, if I like it, then I feel like I'm going to, you know, I'm, 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 I'm good with it. I don't draw for anyone else. And I, and they're my opinions. And, uh, uh, so yeah, if I'm happy with it, I, I, I feel good about the cartoon, but, but, but again, um, uh, you know, I'm always so self-critical that, that, uh, most of the time I'll think, oh, that's a pretty good cartoon, but it's, it's very rare that I think, oh, I just love this cartoon. I'm all, I'm always like, I, I always get down on myself. And when I do a crappy cartoon, it's just like, it just ruins my night because I want to go back to, you know, go back and do another drawing to kind of redeem my, redeem myself. Mm -hmm. So how do you, so how do you get over those? I mean, you're doing drawings every single day. You must have that almost thought process, every, thought process every single day of being like self-critical and self-doubting yourself and have a lot of self-doubt. So how do you kind of get past those moments, if you will? Well, by doing the, doing a, going back the next day and doing another cartoon because you know each cartoon i'm focusing on and and i'm uh, i'm thinking about and then once i do it you know and it runs then then you know the next day if the cartoon if i think it, it if i don't like it if i'm unhappy with it then the next day i can come in and do another cartoon and i have a i have it, it just raises my energy level when i've done a crappy cartoon to come in the next day and do do something better so it's always it's all it's all good even the negative even the negative feelings that i have it's it's all good in the end because it just propels me to keep doing doing the best that i can mm -hmm. well i think that's really cool and and really motivating to hear because i think that if more people saw that on a regular basis in terms of like if I screwed up or, you know, if something didn't go my way this time, be like, it's not over. Like life isn't over just because of that one experience. Like I can rebound myself and, and just come back from that. Um, let's see, what did I want to go into? Um, oh yeah. So you won the Pulitzer prize first back in 95 and then in 2006, I kind of want to tell you or ask you about what, how did that change? How did that change your life? How did that change your career and all that stuff starting back in 1995 after that first one? Yeah. You know, you know, it's the thing about a drawing being a cartoonist. It's such a fun job. And so when you, you know, in the course of a long career, when you occasionally get an award, it's always fun. It's, you know, it's like, it's, it's like, a, it's like great. And, and, and it's great that people are, uh, you know, uh, that, that you've won this award and that people are uh, up, uh, uh, paying attention to you and things. But in the end, the awards aren't the, 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 the big thing to me. The, the, the big thing to me is just being able to do this job, just being able to come in every day and know that I have this, this thing that I can do, this quirky thing uh, that, that, I, that I enjoy doing so much and that I can, you know, I don't really have to deal with going to meetings you know, most people, when they're working a, a daily job, they have to go to meetings. They have to deal with people. I, I, the only time I deal with people is when I bring bring my cartoons out to, to show an editor to see what they think about them. Uh, other than that, I'm just doing my own thing. I can come in, come in when I want, leave when I want. It's just this beautiful thing that I've got, and, and it's the one thing that I, I feel like I have this, this talent for. So I'm so happy that I was able to find a, a place to do it. So, you know, I, I love winning the Pulitzer and, and it's great. And it's, you know, it'll, it's, I have these little awards. They're just tiny. They're just like little cut glass, uh, crystal type things. And, and then you get a little, a little bit of money, but, but it's not, you know, and I would love, I would love to, I love to, I love to win awards. So I'm not knocking awards, but it's just, they pale in comparison to the, to the fact that I can do this every day. Yeah, well, I think it's so cool that you love what you do so much and so passionate about it. Is there like one, I know there's a lot of aspects that we've talked about. I mean, one, you just like drawing. Two, you are into the politics and you like being able to communicate 
your voice and, and whatever it is that you draw, but is there like a particular aspect of it that you enjoy the most that, that you could maybe point out? Yeah. Well, there's a couple things, you know, sometimes, uh, this isn't probably a great example, but I did a cartoon last week and, and, uh, you know, it was when Trump was trying to, uh, you know, he was going to, uh, they were going to, he was going to put sanctions on Mexico. And then, and then, uh, he backed down because he said that Mexico had agreed to something that, but he didn't specify what it was. So, so I was thinking about that and then I, I'm looking on Twitter and on various sites and I see that, um, I see that, uh, Taco Bell is reintroducing nacho fries. Uh, and so, so I started to think about that. So I, so I drew Trump on TV and he's saying, uh, uh, you know, uh, something like nacho fries are coming back to Taco Bell. And then I always draw this couple in my cartoons a lot of times. And the woman's saying, He's still he's still trying to find reasons to to show how the the uh, his threats against me- threat threats against Mexico uh, paid off something like that. But it was just finding it was finding something out there in the culture and then using it in a cartoon. That's that's kind of fun. And the other thing that's fun for me is when I'm drawing, I don't pencil anything in when I draw. I'll do a real really rough sketch to show uh, my editors. But when it comes to drawing, I just I just ink. And so I at the end of the day, I have white out all over my fingers because I've been whiting things out. But so I'm I'm inking. But what, I, what I'll do, like if I if I'm drawing a, a cartoon with Trump in it, I'll look at, you know, I'll, I'll go to Google and I'll go to Google Images and I'll find a, a Trump, uh, a Trump photograph that I like, you know, situated in a way that's going to work for the cartoon. And so I just I don't even sit at a drawing board. I just sit at my desk with my computer and I'll find a picture of Trump and I'll just, I'll just draw it, uh, you know, without, without penciling anything in. And so that what's really fun for me is when I really get a likeness that I really think, Oh, that really captures whomever I'm drawing. That's also a really good feeling. And there are just certain days when there are days when, when I'll try doing a simple drawing and I can't do it. It's like, I have to start over like 10 times. And then there are other times. Uh, there, are, there are other days when I'll be doing some complicated drawing with 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 someone uh, like Trump, uh, who you really, who I really want to get their likeness correct, and it'll just all work out. So it's, you know, every day is different, and it, but it's but it's always fun. Yeah. No, I, I like those couple of things that you pointed out because it's. I feel like the first one touched on just how unconventional the job is in and of itself, and your ideas can come out of anywhere but at the same time you can combine the ideas into one message in one picture um so that's so cool like you're able to literally pull a tweet from taco bell and then like a a political thing like the borders and kind of mix it into one message i think that's so unique yeah we uh another i was just thinking about it another uh one uh, of course trump is uh, i've been drawing trump a lot because he's like in the news he's constantly saying or doing or tweeting things so it's just like never ending. But I don't know if you if you remember he well, first of all, I believe that he's sort of been, uh, you know, uh, uh, he's been sort of ignoring the rule of law, kind of breaking down these norms that we have in our in, in our in our government. And so I don't know if you remember, but there was a, a picture of him from a few months ago where Trump is walking up uh to, to board, walking up the stairs to board Air Force One, and he's got a piece of toilet paper on his shoe. Do you remember that? I think so. Okay, yeah. So it was, it was it's pretty famous because it was it's famous for one thing because no one told him that he had this toilet paper on his shoe, and the fact that he walks all the way up into Air Force One with it on his shoe was pretty funny. Why he was being filmed. So what I did with that one is I I, I drew that only instead of instead of a piece of toilet paper. I've, I've got the U.S. Constitution stuck on the bottom of his shoe, uh, and and so so what I so it was like taking something that was happening and then combining it with something. It's almost like a puzzle, you know. You're trying to you're trying to find these puzzle pieces to make them fit together, and it's 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 really strange, and it's it's sort of a mental exercise every day to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, so these ideas come from just about anywhere and at different points in the day. Have you ever had a day? where you actually haven't been able to come up with anything? You know, 
I have many days like that. And it's, but it's like, I, but, but I have many days like that, but, but, but like I said, it's always, I, I go into a, I go into a, a panic and I'm sitting there and I, and I will come up with something and sometimes they're great. I mean, in, in, in the scheme of things are for, for coming up with something so late in the day there, it turns out really good. Uh, but I've always come up with something and, and it, it, it again, it's just the panic and the, uh, knowing that I'm up, up against my deadline that, that forces me to come up with something. Okay. Got you. Got you. So, and I guess you just come to accept that the panic is going to come most days. Uh, say that again, Nick. I said, I guess you have just come to accept that the panic is just going to come most days. Yeah, but you know, there are days, there are days where I think, okay, this is the day where I don't have anything. I'm just this. I have failed. I, I this. I, you know, what, what am I? Gonna, what am I going to do? And uh, and there are days when I'll start. I'll, I'll have a crappy idea and I'll start drawing it out. And then and then and I've showed it to my editor. I've got it approved. Then I'll then I'm drawing. I think this this is terrible. And so then I'll come up with something even late, and I'll tell my editor, "Listen, I've got another idea." So it's all very last minute. This this whole job. Okay, got you. Well, I want to go a little bit back into the early part of your your career and ask a question there. You know, your your job's super different than anybody else's, but I'm I'm interested. Do, have you did you ever make a super important decision early on in your career that? Looking back on it now, you realize the importance of, but you didn't realize the significance of it of at that time. So, like the most important decision that you made early on that you didn't see, realize the significance of it, of at the time. Yeah, um, gosh, you know, my career has sort of just uh, flowed naturally. Um, I mean, I, I was in, I, I, I was in Greenville, and then uh, I was offered the job in New Orleans, and then and then. Uh, going from new Orleans to Atlanta, that was probably the, uh, probably the, the, the most, uh, the, the biggest decision uh, career wise that I made. And, and, uh, and it, it all turned out well, I think that, I think that people that are watching this, if you just, if, if you just work hard, uh, and, and, you know, get along with people and try your best things usually just kind of work out, you know, you, there wasn't a single decision that I, uh, I'm thinking, oh, I, I wish I hadn't done this. Uh, it, it's just all, it's just all turned out good. Okay. So we, you've won, we've talked about a couple of the Pulitzer Prizes that you won. You've won a number of other awards and you've, you know, become this big editorial cartoonist that, that, you know, a lot of people are familiar with, especially with seeing in the AJC and stuff like that. Is there anything that you're most proud of that maybe people wouldn't think about? Um, gosh, you know, I mean, there, there are various cartoons that I've done that I, I, I'm proud of that I, that I especially liked. Um, you know, I think just, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm humbled at the same time that I, that I have this job that I can, that they keep letting me do it. And, and, uh, and I never take for granted that I, that I that I found this thing, and and I'm just glad that I'm I'm able to keep doing my thing. I, I knew uh, Charles Schultz, uh, the guy. Uh, he, he went by the name Sparky, the guy who did pe- who, who drew peanuts, and uh, and so he his whole life he you know a lot of times with comic strips uh, the the co- the person that does a comic strip will like turn it over to other people or have sort of a staff that does it. But uh, uh, Schultz always did it himself, and he drew it. He came up with the ideas, and uh, and then you know is like when he was I think late seventies, he like had a stroke or something, and then within a few weeks he had passed away. But up until that point, he drew every day, so he got to spend his whole life drawing, doing the thing that he really loved, and 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 that's you know that's if. if if I'm lucky, that's what I'll be able to do. Just keep doing it for, for as long as I can. Um, you know, and, and, and I like a, a guy like Charles Schultz, he, he was interesting because, uh, he was, uh, you know, he's kind of a very quiet person and, uh, and people at these cartoonist conventions that I would go to, uh, the cartoonists around him 
they were very hesitant to talk to him like a real person because he was this this great, you know, this great, uh, amazing cartoonist. Uh, so I remember one time I had drawn a, 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 did a drawing using the Peanuts characters, Charlie Brown and Lucy and Linus or something. And I put, and they were in, in they were in baseball caps or something. I don't, I don't even remember. But Schultz said to me, he said, hey, he said, you drew those baseball caps wrong on the, on, on the characters. And I told him, I said, well, listen, I just did that to, to, to annoy you. And so <laughs> he thought that was fun, he, you know, because no one would, most people don't talk to him in a real way. So I, I sort of had a fun relationship with him. Uh, we could kind of talk in, in, in back and forth and talk about politics a little bit. And uh, so, so that, you know, I have, all, you know, I've met so many interesting people in my career, which is, is really been a, a, a fun uh, thing, a fun extra thing. To, to do with this job. Yeah, right. Is there any particular ability that you think maybe like sets you apart to be a, a really good as an editorial cartoonist? Like what allowed you to get to this point that maybe holds other people back? Like any certain ability that has allowed you to kind of get to this level? Mm. Well, you know what? I, I What I try and do when I'm drawing my editorial cartoons is I try to make a strong point but at the same time, I try to use humor. And so I think that's been a, a, a thing, a, a positive thing from, from, from my cartoons because uh, it's, it's sort of easy to make a hard-hitting point. Uh, the, 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 hard, the, the difficult thing is to make a hard-hitting point and, you, and make it funny. Mm -hmm. So I think, that's, I think that's where my talent lies. And... and uh, and that, that's what I, that's what I try to do, you know, depending on the subject matter, I try and use humor to, to, to make my points. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you haven't done yet in your career? Any like particular thing that you know, that's something that you want to be able to accomplish or get done? Yeah. You know, um, uh, one of these days I'm going to, um, I, I would like to take up painting and, uh, you know, I, I love impressionist paintings, and I, I would love to do something like that. Uh, but right now, I my my cartooning keeps me pretty much occupied, and and uh, so I'm happy just doing what I'm doing right now. Yeah, you just got to have your wife give you lessons. I know, I know. She 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 should. <laughs> well, very good, awesome. Well, um, coming down here toward towards the end, last couple of questions. So. Sure. One of the questions I, I I like to ask, I always start off with uh, throwing out the age question first. So how how old are you currently? I'm currently 59 and a half. All right, 59 and a half. Awesome, very specific. So uh, <laughs> and <laughs> 10 years down the road, uh, you're going to be 69 and a half, right? Um, yes. Tell me what 69 and a half year old Mike Lukovich looks like. What have you done? What have you accomplished? And, and what are you currently doing? Oh, gosh. You know, that's, that's a great question. Uh, uh, I will probably keep doing what I've always done, which is I exercise regularly. So hopefully I'll be in halfway decent shape. Love it. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully maybe have some grandkids. We have four children. Uh, two of them are married. One of them got married just, I think, three weekends ago. Uh, so I'll probably have grandkids by then. Uh, hopefully, you know, my mind will still be sound. You know, it's, uh, you know, 59. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm six months away from being 60 years old. So that's like, oh my God, I never thought that would happen. Yeah. So we'll, 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 we'll see. I, that's, uh, who knows, Nick? Yeah. I don't know. It's life is life. So unpredictable. I understand. I understand. Well, well, awesome. But before I ask the last question, Mike, I want to, I want to acknowledge you. I think that your, your passion for your job is, is so cool and, and so infectious and you can anybody listening or, or watching can just can just tell from your energy from it i think a lot of people can say that they like their job or they're passionate about their what their job or they're doing what their passion is but yeah. to be able to hear you and see you like it it's it's so obvious about how much you truly enjoy it and how much uh you believe in what you do. And I think that it's also really cool that you can every single day go in there and create something completely new and completely yeah. from scratch. Cause I think like, uh, it's great. Hey, well, listen, uh, 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 your viewers, if I'm on Twitter, yeah, it's uh, Mike Lukovich. I'm not sure. Hey, I think if you just type in Mike Lukovich, you'll, you'll, you can go to my site. 
and I'm also on Facebook, and or you can go to AJC.com, and you can see my cartoons every day, and there's a there's a large archive, so people can keep up with me even if they don't get the if they don't get the AJC delivered to them. Right, right. Awesome. Well, I was just going to uh, allow you to say those things as well. And it's M-I-K-E-L-U-C-K-O-V-I-C-H, correct? Yes, that's correct. Perfect, perfect. Just for um, people listening on the audio and everything like that. Well, awesome. Well, I appreciate the. So the last question I always ask everybody is, um, the like I, we talked about beforehand, I believe that becoming the best version of yourself, I believe it's a constant journey. I don't know if we're ever at the best version of ourselves. I think that we're always striving to be better today than we were uh, yesterday and all, and all that sort of thing. And I also believe that becoming the best version of yourself is a very unique journey. I think that the way that you're going to become the best version of yourself is going to be different than the way that I become the best version of myself. So what I want to ask for you personally is if you could currently do or work on three things to get you closer to that best version of Mike Walkovich that you could be, what are those three things that you could currently do or currently work on? Okay, let's see. I think one thing would be to, and I'm trying to work on this, is, and I tell my kids this, you know, whatever is bothering you right now, uh, you know, you have to kind of realize that a week from now, you're probably going to, there's some probably something else that's going to be bothering you. So try not to, Try not to get too upset about things. Just kind of roll with the punches because, you know, life is is difficult and we all have issues and we all have problems. But if you can kind of realize, okay, this thing isn't going to this thing isn't going to take over my life. I'm going to be able to deal with this and then go on to the next thing. I I think that's one thing. And I I work on that myself. I try not to get too worked up about things. Uh, Let's see what else. Oh, uh. You know, I procrastinate a lot, but I, uh, when it comes to my job, and, but I'm working on trying to uh, address things. Uh, like if I need to get something done, you know, whether it's something mundane like yard work or just getting something done, it's better in those kind of cases not to procrastinate, to just go out and get it done. Because then once it's done, it's off your mind. And then you, it kind of frees you to... to, to uh, you know, not be burdened stuff. So I'm, I guess what I'm guess what I'm saying is that I'm trying to make uh, in my own life and with, with my children's lives, I'm trying to teach them that you sh- you don't need to be burdened by stuff because a lot of it it's, it's just it's just silliness that you just have to plow through. And so I ne- need to come up with a third thing, don't I, Nick? Don't I, Nick? <laughs> you do. <laughs> Let's see. Um, well, but before before you come up with a third thing, I wanted to. I'll give you a little time to think about it because the first one, the first one that I really like, you said like don't get upset or like don't kind of dwell. I guess kind of don't dwell on something, don't get too upset about it, and let it linger with you because I think that's kind of in an instance what you do a lot of times when maybe you feel like you didn't have a great drawing. Like this is what this is what came to me when you started talking about. It. I was like, he doesn't do a great drawing, but that lets that motivates him to do just something that much better the next time. And I felt like. That's what I went to when you first said, don't get upset too much about one thing. Just kind of move on and know like it's not the end of the world. Right. So I'm sort of contradicting myself there, aren't I? Because, you know, I, I, I cartooning, but, but I always know with cartooning, I can get upset and, but I know that, that the next day I can redeem myself. So it doesn't, it's not a long lasting. No, I, I, I wasn't saying you were contradicting yourself at all. I was saying that you were living exactly what you were saying was important to do. That you're yet that you're not getting too upset about it. You're just letting it motivate you. Right, right, yeah. So I'm still thinking of that third thing I got to come <laughs> up with. Uh, let's see. Something maybe about your kids. You know, we've talked a lot about career, but yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I, you know, I, I'm naturally, I think, kind of a reserved person, and so when it does come to my wife and my kids, I have to. You know, uh, it's important for me to always try to remain connected. Uh, earlier in my life, I had uh, it was more of a more of an issue for me. It's not as much now, but it's something that I I am aware of that I need to stay. You know, sometimes I need to get out of my shell a little bit and 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 be be more present to my family and to, and 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 so that is again, it's just a. a one of those things that you work on through, throughout your life to try to try and be better at. 
Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, those are three great things. I really loved them. I think that the uh, the third one you came up with one that third one you came up with was awesome. So, well, I appreciate your time today, Mike. Hey, thank you, Nick. It was great talking to you.